Next, on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show, here's Ryan O'Neill. He's here. It's that time of week. Uh, Alfred University political science professor emeritus Dr. Robert A. Heinemann comes into the studio. Yes, pleased to be here, Brian. Pleased to be here. Okay, um, if you could give us an overview of the impeachment process. Are we looking at uh, an impeachment inquiry or an official impeachment? Well, I, here's what I'd like to do is just take our listeners uh, back a little bit here. Uh, because uh, this has been very cleverly organized um, by the opposition to Trump. And uh, we have to understand that the opposition to Trump uh, began uh, the moment he was elected. So that uh, the idea of giving the new president a honeymoon period uh, for Mr. Trump just doesn't apply. The uh, pseudo-intellectuals in the country... Uh, took after him from the very beginning. So he had, uh, uh, and given his temperament and approach to being president, it did not take him long then to really irritate uh, the inside the Beltway bureaucracy and uh, irritate uh, the press, uh, really pretty nasty with the press. Of course, they weren't nice to him either. Um uh, and then uh, this uh, spread over to some Republicans, you know, some never Trump uh, Republicans. And then, of course, you had uh, the Hillary supporters and uh, the Democrats who lost. And then you end up with a, a Democrat majority in the House of Representatives. Now, this is a pretty heavy load to carry uh, for one guy. And Trump has uh, managed to irritate all these people, and they've worked diligently uh, to throw him out of uh, office. And uh, no other president has carried this kind of uh, load. Uh, uh, you know, you, some uh, no other elected president, let's put it that way. Then, of course, as our listeners know, we uh, followed up with the uh, Mueller investigation. Two years, $25 million dollars. Mueller investigated this uh, half-baked rumor that somehow uh, the Trump people had colluded with the Russians, and uh, which uh, can I say something came, right now? Came to really nothing after Mueller got done spending all that money and time. Doc, can I stop you right there on the when you said Russia? But go ahead. I, I wanted to say something about the Russia thing. I don't know how many of our listeners are aware Russia and Ukraine uh, are not what you call best friends. Isn't it a little contradictory for uh, the Democrats to say, oh, he's, it's the Russians, it's the Russians. Oh, no, it's the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians. It's kind of, that would be kind of like saying it's the capitalists. No, it's the communists. I mean, which is it? I don't know. Where's your question going there? Well, my question is, aren't they being a little contradictory by saying that both Russia and the Ukraine are guilty of uh, influencing? No, I don't know. I, I think the argument about, about the Russians, the Russians did. I don't think there's any question that the Russians were involved in... Putting things on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, there's no question about that. <laughs> the other side of it is, there's no question that uh, the Ukrainians are uh, pretty corrupt. And uh, Mr. Biden made full use of that. But the point here is... So after the Mueller investigation then, and we come up with nothing, then uh, uh, the Democrats, of course, begin moving toward uh, the... Uh, uh, Ukrainian phone call. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. And uh, now we go into secret committee he hearings and uh, slowly uh, leak information out here and there to the press about these amazing uh, findings and the, the terrible things that Mr. Trump has done, all coming out of secret hearings, which the Republicans have no chance to say uh, anything at all. And so as a result of that, of course, uh, the Democrats found themselves getting on, uh, under all kinds of attack for the process, which they you know, certainly had a uh, uh, tremendously unfair process and so now the Republicans were able to hit the process, and uh, obviously the Democrats thought, well, we got to get out of this situation. So now they have moved to these hearings, 
again, this whole force of opposition to Trump coming into play. And uh, now we're at these uh, the so-called in- inquiry, investigation. And uh, the, uh, the way they're playing it now is, of course, you get a tremendous amount of hearsay. He said, they said, and the press then grabs it immediately and takes it and tries to play it for all they can. So you have this whole series of efforts here uh, to undermine Trump. And, uh, of course, at this point, you have bureaucrats stepping forward saying, well, you know, I think that was not the right thing to do or that wasn't the way to handle it. Uh, Hold it just a minute. Mr. Trump is the elected president, and you may not like what he's doing, uh, but the approach there is to vote him out of office. Um, not to undermine him and uh, undercut him with leaks and uh, things of that sort. So uh, at this point, it's uh, that's where it is, and uh, we'll have to see how uh, how much uh, more effective uh, the uh, hearings can be. And uh, to this point, uh, we don't see. Well, the point is, it gives the uh, media now something more to chew on and use and sort of slant one way or another. Uh, and I'm not certain. Well, we'll just have to see. And the uh, the point of this whole thing is, of course, that uh, Schiff's committee can make recommendations, but the House Judiciary Committee is the one that will have to make. Uh, if there's going to be a recommendation to the Senate. I think it has to go through them. So they're kind of hanging Schiff and his guys out there, <laughs> and uh, letting them see what they can do. And so there, yeah. that's the overview. And you had some. The specific questions there? Or? Yeah, Senator Lindsey Graham was on Sean Hannity the other night, and he said, if, well, he said, any trial in the U.S. Senate cannot be based in hearsay. Lindsey Graham went on to say the trial would go to the Senate. Let's say they get 218 votes. They're not going to try the president on hearsay. A trial in the Senate should not legitimize what's been going on in the House. No American is denied the right to call witnesses on their own behalf, except for Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, this whole thing about hearsay, and again, I'm not an attorney, so you could talk to uh, some of the local attorneys about this, but the problem with hearsay is, uh, in in any trial, as Lindsey Graham points out, you have a right to confront (laughs) the people who are testifying against you. Now, it's true, and in some cases with hearsay, for example, uh, both sides can stipulate to uh, allow the information to come into the court, and that's fine. But the problem with hearsay is uh, somebody says, I overheard this, or uh, he said this, or she said that, and you got no chance to go back and talk to the people who actually are supposed to have said this or that. And so it's, uh, in most cases, I think, it, it's just not allowed in uh, a, a regular adversarial trial. Um and, uh, again, uh, Lindsey Graham's right. They're, they're using all these. I think one of them is uh, that someone, uh, someone's secretary overheard a phone call in a restaurant. Uh, but, I mean, it is so uh, 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 attenuated that uh, in any kind of trial, I mean, this stuff would be out the window immediately. Um, so, yeah, uh, that uh, obviously the, some of the Republicans are beginning to sharpen their uh, saws and nails and Ready to go here if if this ed ends up in the Senate. Can I'm not certain it will, frankly, at this point. But now, ahead. Speaker Nancy Pelosi said uh, in a press conference on uh, Thursday around noon that President Donald Trump admitted to bribery. Yeah, now that term is now they're throwing that term around, and again, uh, the press is picking it up. But uh, as far as I can tell, there's nothing at all to indicate any kind of uh, when it comes to bribery, I think the B- Biden's, Biden's come a lot closer to that. than, uh, But uh, the idea that Trump somehow took money for something or other is, uh, I mean, it's just, it's just not there. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says this is worse than Nixon. Yeah, well, that's clearly untrue. Um, and uh, you like Nixon. Who, I? I said you, you kind of like Nixon, but you're Yeah, saying- I'm, I'm sorry. I was, I, I was too old to vote for him. Uh, uh, three times. I could only vote for him twice. But nonetheless, I supported him the first time around. Um, 
But uh, no, Nixon and his cohorts, uh, and I don't know how you know deeply involved Nixon himself was involved, but certainly his cohorts were involved in criminal activity, clearly criminal activity. Yeah. And, uh, and quite a number of them went to jail. Um, so the idea that this is worse than Nixon, you you got to be nuts. I mean, that's just totally in It's not even close. Day. No, no. And I think I, I, I haven't heard people, the, the phone is ringing off the hook with Nixon defenders. Uh, <laughs> but I would say that probably a lot of Nicks, uh, probably a lot of the newsmaker listeners feel that Nixon was railroaded and the other side was doing similar things. And it's not fair because Johnson did a lot of stuff and the, the liberal media was ganging up on Nixon. I don't like Nixon at all. Because of the dirty trick stuff, and I've listened to a lot of the uh, Nixon tapes, and that's why I don't like him. Well, uh, the press certainly did not like Nixon, and again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but you go right. back on, uh, he made his reputation there by going after Alger Hiss and some of these other uh, uh, communist sympathizers and spies, and of course it turns out that Alger Hiss was in fact a spy. And a very effective spy for the uh, Soviet Union. And some of these others like I.F. Stone and some of these other gung-ho liberal journalists. And, of course, I was in Washington, D.C. during this time. You know, all the liberals were talking about, well, I.F. Stone says this about, well, at that point, I guess it was, uh, yeah, I guess it was Nixon. Uh, and uh, Stone, it turns out, was a fellow traveler of the Soviets as well. Um, so uh, the... Um, and what's interesting today now is that Hillary Clinton is saying Tulsi Gabbard is a Soviet uh, resource. I mean, yeah, <laughs> give me a break. She's uh, kind of interesting, that Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah, she is. She makes she a is. lot of valid points. Yeah, yeah, she's she's kind of a uh, thorn in the side of a lot of people. Um, so go ahead. Do you have any other questions? Yes, I have a, a question. Um, how is this going to affect the American people? The, the, we know, well, let me say it this way. Uh, the people in the middle, because we know that Trump supporters are, are just going to roll their eyes. It's another accusation that they did completely disbelieve. And the liberals and those who watch CNN and MSNBC will believe what they're seeing on those networks. What about the others, the ones who are less in tune? Well, I, I do think there is a large uh, segment of the public here that isn't paying much attention to this at all. Now, I know uh, some of our listeners will think, oh, no, that's – no, I think it's true. I think most of them uh, – I think who was it the other night, uh, Wednesday night, I guess it was, um, Laura Ingram said that after watching the hearings a while, she thought that probably uh, Dr. Phil Nielsen's ratings went out of sight. <laughs> yeah, they were so dull. That, it uh, was. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the um, – uh, most Americans are, have, deal with what we call the privatization of values. They're far more interested in paying their mortgage payments, what their kids are doing in school, whether the Buffalo Bills are going to win yes. the next game. Yeah. They don't care about this stuff at all. And so uh, I don't think, yeah, I, I find it hard to believe. Now, you know, if something really dramatic comes up, um, I suppose you might be able to get uh, the attention of Americans. But uh uh, so I uh, I think the middle uh, hasn't even begun to give it uh, much attention yet at this point. Um, now I do think. If you got any other questions, here, we'll, well segue I into tend the... to think, and this is just a speculation, that people like Adam Schiff are counting on those people not to pay a whole lot of attention and just to see a lot of headlines that are anti-Trump. From the sort yeah, of things that yeah. Schiff feeds the media, and they'll come to the conclusion: well, he's always under attack. He must. He's always under suspicion. He must be a crook. I think that's what they're hoping for. But there's another side to that. There's the feel bad for the guy that's getting ganged up on. Well, element. and and again, uh, I think the other side of it is Trump is the incumbent, and uh, he's uh, the incumbent over a. Um, uh, stock market rally and economic rally that's going on for now something like 10 years, I believe. Longest rally in, uh, I guess, history. I don't know. Back in 1820, they may have had a big rally. I don't know. But no, the point is uh, the economy is booming, and Trump is taking credit for that, and justifiably so. Now, 
the other night I heard him, he was talking to one of the economic clubs and pointed out that he thought uh, the boom was more, of course, he takes credit for the tax bill, which cut taxes here and there. But he, his view was that the real key to the economic boom was the uh, killing all these regulations. And I think he's absolutely right. Um, doing away with these regulations in a lot of these industries and areas just frees Americans to, out from under the thumb of these inside the beltway and other types of agency people and allows Americans to do what they do best, is go out and make a lot of money. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, he's taken responsibility for that. He's going to take responsibility for pulling American troops out of the Middle East. And uh, I see now the Taliban seems to once again be making efforts to try to reopen negotiations. So we get out of Afghanistan, we, get, we pull troops out of uh, Syria, um, so there'll be, uh, I mean, that's, uh, and I guess, uh, generally speaking, American veterans are very supportive of Trump. And then uh, you got situations like making Jerusalem uh, uh, our embassy uh, location and uh, the uh, uh, trade negotiations with uh, China, which seem to be uh, right on the edge of making some breakthroughs. I mean, there are... Uh, all kinds of things that he can go out and, and uh, take credit for. Again, you, the unemployment rate for, I think, black people is the lowest it's been since that number has been recorded. Hispanics, uh, low uh, unemployment as well. So uh, the, uh, the fact is he's got a lot that he can lay on the table and say, uh, hey, this is what I've actually done. Um, and uh, so they can, you know, Schiff can try to get uh, all the bad publicity he wants, uh, I think there are some real facts that uh, he just can't change. And so I, I, I think the guy is inside the bubble, inside the beltway. You know. uh, uh, how is the Democrats' primary process doing Biden and Warren? Well, yes, and that's and interesting you would ask that because uh, I think uh, the last week we've had a number of uh, – uh, moves that indicate that uh, the uh, candidates that we have out there in the field now, and I don't know, there's what, 18 of them or something like that still out there. What, are maybe 12 of them are going to be in the next debate. Um, and so these people have been working very hard and they spent a lot of money, and my goodness, uh, uh, their days must be constantly filled with shaking hands and eating fried chicken and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, then all of a sudden, uh, Mike Bloomberg decides to become a candidate. And now De uh, Duvall Patrick, former, former governor, Massachusetts governor uh, in the he's decided to become a candidate. So these guys come bouncing in here, uh, and uh, naturally this irritates the people who've been in there for quite So you're getting some real nastiness, I think, back and forth here. But I think what these guys coming in for, and of course there's still room for Governor Cuomo, uh, I think what these guys are showing is that, uh, hold it here just a minute, the candidates we got out there, they're just not going to be able to pull the load. And uh, there may be a spot here somehow that I can slip in here and uh, get this thing uh, moving uh, toward uh, away from Trump and toward the Democrats. Uh, so it's really a commentary on what a weak field is out there right now. Governor Andrew Cuomo, by the way, issued a statement right after the uh, California school shooting on Thursday. And uh, he said, uh, summing it up, the final sentence, until you do something, this is on you, Mr. President and Leader Mitch McConnell. Yeah, well, that's that's outrageous. Uh, how that's does that play, sick. though, if he wants to run for president? Well, uh, yeah, uh, he's going to obviously there are a lot of people uh anti-gun and, and uh, concerned about these school shootings, which anybody should be. There's no two ways about that. But uh, uh, I think one of the problems that the candidates uh, for the presidency right now have, and that's why I said just a few minutes ago, I'm not certain this will go to the Senate. Because uh, if it goes to the Senate, uh, six of these candidates are senators. And that means... Uh, the uh, they're going to have to be there. I mean, they don't have to be there, 
but they're not going to look good being out on the campaign trail while there's a uh, proceeding going on in the Senate to try to convict and remove the president uh, through impeachment. And uh, so there's six of them uh, that'll be tied up, and it could be for six weeks, uh, could be two months, tied up in uh, a trial of some sort, uh, taking him off the campaign trail. And it's going to be, I think, pretty unseemly for them to be out campaigning uh, for impeachment when they're supposed to be sitting as the jurors uh, in terms of deciding whether to uh, convict the president or not. So I think you got at least six candidates there that might be suggesting to the Democrats in the House, uh, hey, hold it here, guys. You know, uh, maybe we better slow this whole thing down. Um, you've done the best you could. You've tried to embarrass the president. Now let's just let it go. Because if it gets to the Senate, uh, I think these guys can kiss a goodbye. Uh, because uh, now you've got, uh, uh, what, another six or seven candidates that are going to be out there really, uh, well, Joe Biden and Bloomberg and a number of others that can be really making uh, time, I think, while these guys <laughs> are tied up with their antipathy to Mr. Trump. So that, you know, that's taking a kind of interesting turn there, I think. Could we uh, talk about uh, your former student, Congressman Tom Reed, for a moment? Oh, what a fine, what a fine fellow! Yes. <laughs> uh, Reed, t- two things. One, Reed got a Leon Panetta Institute Award for his bipartisan uh, work with the Problem Solvers Caucus. Oh, I didn't see that. That's good. Yeah, it was. Oh, what was that? Tuesday or Wednesday? Oh, good, good. The other thing is uh, Thursday afternoon. He's one of my students, you know. The yeah. <laughs> Reed uh, praised Thursday afternoon House Speaker Pelosi because Pelosi says that a uh, United States Mexico Canada trade deal is imminent. Well, I hope so uh, because that's that's really important. And uh, the Trump people have been pushing this. And, uh, again, that'll, that should open up trade even further. And, again, uh, give another boost to an economy that's already buzzing right along. Um, so I, I'm, I hope, yeah, I hope Pelosi is able to pull that off with all this other. That's, again, that's one of the problems with all this impeachment garbage is that uh, they're not paying attention to some things they really should be doing and helping the American uh, working class. And um, so that would be good. That would be a real plus. Down to the last two minutes, Dr. Bob. Uh, George Soros's wins and losses, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Fairfax County, Virginia. Yes. Yes. Well, apparently they now have a district attorney in San Francisco uh, who is, uh, to put a mildly, a really liberal. Uh, and again, again, I don't have all of facts on this, but I believe his parents um, were involved in a, well, they're part of the the under, underground, the weathermen underground, and uh, I think one of them was killed in a, a shooting in which two cops were killed, and so uh, Bernadette Dorn and Bill Ayers, the weather ground, weather, uh, weatherman underground uh, spokespeople, uh, raised this guy. Uh, and he's very proud of him, and he's very proud of his parents, and uh, he's just uh, made it clear that in terms of prosecuting anybody out in uh, San Francisco, you, the streets are yours. And uh, again, Mr. Soros must be happy that his money's been well invested. Not in Monroe County, however, Brian. No. Nope. Yeah, why do you think that was that uh, Soros' DA candidate lost so badly when other Democrats do really well? Well, I, I, some of it, well, again, it depends on uh, quite a number of things. But one of them, in San Francisco, I mean, the question is, is this guy running against uh, just one uh, opponent or is he running against three, maybe there's three or four in the race? Um, and... Uh, Again, in uh, Monroe County, uh, I guess they poured 800000 into the uh, challenger's uh, um, coffers. And, but, of course, you had an incumbent Republican there who was uh, reasonably popular. And basically she uh, used the Soros money as a part of her campaign, uh, t- asking people if they wanted George Soros to, p- to pick the DA in uh, 
Monroe County, and apparently uh, not knew too many people did. Um, so uh, it just kind of varies depending on the, and you can expect, and I assume he, his organization, what is it, uh, the Open Society Foundation, I think is the name of it, uh, you can expect they have, it would be interesting to get inside there and just take, uh, maybe uh, Jim O'Keefe can get Veritas in there and get us some, <laughs> some inside information on how that's all, because I bet they have a really sophisticated uh Approach not only to uh, what uh, what places are vulnerable, but how to approach their targets and such. It would be interesting. We're over time, Doctor Heineman. Okay, uh, folks. Yeah. Hey, uh, when pr- professors are late, what was the rule? You, you wait ten minutes if it they got the. A, yeah, if they have a doctor. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, it was like five minutes if it's a uh, bachelor's and. Our masters or something, and then, I have no idea. Yeah. I was always on time. Do they pay overtime? Not so much in, my in students, pro- so. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Do they pay the professors overtime. Uh, there's some interesting things happening in that respect. SEIU has orga- has uh, organized the adjunct professors at Nazareth, and uh, there's some interesting things coming down the pike in that respect. But that's another show. We're way over time. Are we on the air here yet? (laughs) That's the question.